The WWH show. This is a show that asks a series of why, what, and how questions on topics that have national, regional, and global significance and implications. Today, we have such a topic to talk about, which is why Ethiopian women are not at the front and leading. I have the honor to have this discussion with Dr. Maigena Shefarov. She is the president of Center for the Rights of Ethiopian Women, in short, crew. She has PhD from the University of Wisconsin. She has been teaching at universities on topics like education, and she is an advocate for women's rights. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, this is your first time, so welcome, and we're glad that you're here. Thank you. Yeah, so the first question is, you know, I had a discussion with another uh, women's rights issue uh, advocate. Her name is Veronica Adams. We talked about, in general, the rights of women. But today, I would like to talk to you about uh, women issues, specifically to Ethiopians women's issue. And the first question I have is based on the, the theme we selected, which is why Ethiopian women are not at the front and leading, because go to political party meetings, go to community organizations meeting, go to uh, social events and so on. The key players, if there are discussions, if there are some tasks you know, to take and so on, these are men at the front and leading. But behind the scene, the majority of the jobs are done by women. Why women are not at the front and leading? Is it because of our culture? Is it because of our men? Or is it because of the women themselves? Or a mix of this? All of, all of the above. All of the above, okay. <laughs> a mix of all. Okay. Um, mainly, I would take the, the culture, the first one, the culture. Our culture is a patriarchal culture. Women are subordinate um, for all practical areas. From the household to the political power, we are supported. Um, women are regarded as uh, family, take, take care, um, breadwinners. In a sense, breadwinners, but not the main breadwinners. Um, so in many occasions, especially in the political area, women are not taking part. But that doesn't mean that this is all the time. We have significant number of women who have taken the role of leadership in many in occasions in okay. politics, in cultural issues, in community organizations, in many, many ways. But they are not as, uh, the number is not very significant to, uh, in, you know, as, as men. Yeah, look, the numbers, for example, women are maybe half or even above half of the population. Mm -hmm. Think about the responsibilities they are shouldering. More than 75% of the, the responsibilities are taken care of by women. But yeah. we don't have even 5 or 2% of women leading. So it's, there is a big gap. There is a disparity here. Um, I think one of the most important things why we are not in the forefront is because we are not organized. Um, organization is very, very important for women to be conscious of their rights and responsibilities. And also, uh, in terms of you know, education is number one, that we, ha we don't have as much education as men have. Um, the educational system is not really encouraging women to be leaders. Um, I did my PhD dissertation in uh, Zambia. Okay. And, um, it was about educational policies and practices affecting females. And interestingly, the Zambian educational system is very uh, pro-women and, uh, you know. Advanced than uh, Ethiopia's? Uh, well, in, in, in practice, in, in, in paper. Okay. But in practice, that's what I was going to tell you. But in practice, um, they have uh, scheduled the, the classes. Uh, like, for example, women will go to home, home making classes and men can, will go to carpentry classes at the same hour. So they have no choice to go to carpentry classes instead of going to, um, you know, they have to go to home making class instead of going to yeah, carpentry classes. If a classes. female 
student, if she goes to the carpenter, maybe she will be bold yes. or discouraged. Or discouraged. Even, yeah. So the educational systems are, you know, even if in paper they are good, but they do not really promote women's equality. And also access to education is very, very difficult in Ethiopia. Many, can you imagine, um, it's only 35% uh, of Ethiopian women, adult women, are literate. That means 65% of Ethiopian women above the age of 15 cannot read and write uh, you know, in any language in the country. So which means if they are not educated, they it's unlikely be. that they become leaders. Because exactly. to become a leader, somebody has to be empowered educationally, educationally psychologically, culturally. in experience, culturally, and so on. But as far as they are not educated, as far as they are not being given opportunities to empower themselves, it's unlikely that they become leaders. So that's why that's, uh, they, that's are not taking at, uh, they are not at the front and taking leadership. Right. And also, as I said earlier, organization is very important. And women can't get organized in any way they want. Uh, you know, uh, self-help organizations or um, empowering women like um, rights organizations they have to be able to organize community organizations. But at the same time, this organization should be led by women so that that can reflect their um, problems, their situations. Um, currently, um, the civic, the society and charity law prohibits uh, organizations to advocate for women and children. Why? That is a, the new law, which enact, was enacted in 2009. That so was one of the things. So the government is acting as if there is no women issue. That means <laughs> they know there that is no they, inequality no, of they know gender. They know they are. They have. A, they know there is a big women's issue. But um, one of the requirements for these NGOs, civil society organizations, who advocate for women and children, they cannot get uh, their funding um, from. Women advocate organizations. Women, women, women advocate, human rights advocate, children's advocate, disabled people advocate, governance advocate. All these organizations cannot get their funding from international, from international sources. What is the premises behind? What is the reason for them to do that? Um, they said you can only have 10 percent of your funding from international organizations. The reason is that assuming that some of these international organizations who are funding these local NGOs are influencing them, you know. But the so government, for example, uh, whether it is, you know, regional state budgets or federal uh, budget, they are taking from international organizations, funding from uh, IMF, World Bank, they are indebted to their uh, neck. So why they take money from the international community, but they deny non-profits to get funding from the international That's community? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. And in fact, um, a week ago, we had a conference, the CRU, um, the Center for the Rights of Ethiopian Women, had a conference on the role of civil societies in the upcoming 2012, 2015 elections. And one of the topics that we have discussed was what is this CSO law that prohibits um, uh, organizations that are working on rights issues uh, not to get you know, their funding from outside, or even not to be allowed to talk about rights issues in the, in the country. And one of the person who was discussing this was a very knowledgeable person who came from Ethiopia recently and who had experience in, during the formation of this law. And one of the reasons he told us was that um, the government is really fearful of the influence of NGOs uh, I mean, and globe, uh, and, uh, foreign NGOs or foreign donors on the local NGOs who are working on the right issues. And they said that's a security issue, uh, sovereignty issue. And so these are the kind of impediments for women's organization not to really be fruitful to, add, to help women to get into that position of leadership. Uh, uh, but yes, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. We uh, we give the background to uh, our audience that uh, even if women constitute the majority of the population, even if they are uh, doing the majority of the jobs at the family level, organizational level, and nationally, they're not empowered. They're not educated. That's why they are not in leadership. And also, there are laws that prevent many women rights 
organizations to promote women's issues because they don't have funding. If you don't have funding, you cannot really do anything because everything requires you to have resources. The government is not supporting. Locally, you can't really generate enough money. So internationally, you can't have funding. So yes, that's the issue. So, but let's talk about uh, uh, gender relation in Ethiopia. What are those intentional or unintentional things that uh, Ethiopian men are doing that undermine the role of women in leadership or that uh, withhold the success of uh, women? Well, men are all socialized from early childhood that they are uh, superior to women, to girls. Um, parents um, choose men to go to school if there is a choice or if there is some if there is you know resource Limitation, limitations yeah. if they should choose the, choose, the, choose, choose the boy the yeah the, they choose the choose boy, boy, the boy. Okay. and women are supposed to be at working at home uh, so men are socialized that way and they are always um, feel like that they should be the leaders they should be the breadwinners they should be going to you know school and that's socialization is very strong from childhood up to. And then when they go to school, schools are socia socializing them, just like, like I said, the, the curriculum socializes them to yeah. be you know, in, in a better position to, to, to govern, to, to be leadership. So our men felt that they are superior in terms of leadership. It may be unconscious. They it's may maybe, not even well, know it. It may be unconscious, but there are some conscious people who are not doing that. But in the majority, I mean, when you think of the situation and the political situation, um, every time there is some gathering, as I said earlier, you see only men. But they also, believe me, organizers run around to find women to have just there to say that there are some we women have some here. Women. So, yeah. for just, just the so, numbering, so exactly. superficially, superficially, for propaganda. But they are not saying that, oh, who would be the best person, you know, so and so, I mean, a woman, would be the best person to talk to on this. And they say that, oh, who can, you know, who, where will you get women? So that shows that there's a subordinate, always a subordinate role women play. And um, that is very, very discouraging for younger people. To join, yeah, to, to join. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, I understand that many Ethiopian organizations in the diaspora they are led by men. But uh, you know, I came to Isad two years ago, even more than two years ago originally, and I didn't see any one woman. I came a year and a half ago. So that's wh that's that's when I I began this program. When I came there, I saw three, four women even, some of them are in leadership positions. So ISAT looks like they embraced that women, they play key roles, we need them. And I understand that whether it is in the field, you know, in the fight against the tyranny, in the fight against, uh, you know, injustice in Ethiopia, women are bold, uh, heroine, they fight, they, they are strong, they can take leadership, they can uh, achieve great things if they are allowed, if they are uh, empowered to become leaders. And I see that at ESAT, for example, and I see these, you know, women, what they could do. They are very dynamic, they work hard, I see that. So what would have happened if our political organizations, community organizations, churches, and other community organizations embrace women, allowing them to take leadership, not just for the number case, just for diversity case, but to make sure that we use their wisdom, we use their uniqueness, their talent, because we're wasting their talent if we don't allow them to flourish in leadership. Yeah, at the same time, the women have to be conscious of seeking those leadership, want to be a leader. But to make them conscious, there should be an uh, enable, enabling environment so that they would be able to learn about their rights and responsibilities and also um, you know, n be knowledgeable of what is going on. It's not for the sake of number, but they have to be good uh, leaders who know the, the, the situations in the country, the political, economic, and social situations. So in order to do that, women have to be conscious. And the, I believe, I strongly believe that having a women's organization will allow them to become conscious. And those organizations we talked about, 
for example, the Ethiopian Women's Lawyers Association in Ethiopia was really a wonderful uh, organization that okay. helped a you lot of a lot them of when I was in Ethiopia. yes th th that helped a lot of women who were you know bound to be abused you know just because they are women but these women fight for them but now they are not really almost functional yeah, because of this yeah. th because of that law the CSO yeah. law uh, which barred them not to get. Um, funding from the international organization. And I think the government in Ethiopia, they may understand that if we, are, if we have enlightened women, it will be very difficult for them to use some lame principles, ideologies to divide Ethiopians alongside their ethnic groups. Because when we have enlightened women, that means they are very strong, very influential. Think about it, for every man, you have a mother that you love, you have a sister, a wife, a daughter you love. So if you have in your house well-enlightened women, you can imagine how they can even encourage, embolden the men to fight injustice, to fight this silly, non-productive, you know, uh, non uh, biased policy of dividing Ethiopians alongside ethnic groups. So I think by barring women, by suppressing women, by neglecting women, what they are doing is they are buying time so that they don't have this conscious society that fights their biased policies. I'm not sure that's, you know, the reason why. It is um, not only for women, it's for men and uh, women that there is no freedom of speech, there is no freedom of assembly, there is no uh, association, you know, in the country there is all these basic human rights are not permitted. But in the constitution, it's there. It's, it's, you know, when you read the constitution, it's so beautiful. It looks like yeah. any other democratic country. But they are not enabling the people to implement the constitution. So that's one of the reasons. But culturally, women have not been in the forefront. And in addition to that, if they are barred from being conscious because of limited resources and uh, not freedom of association and, and, and praise, then they are so doubly oppressed, you know, culturally as well as well, by the government politically. So women would be conscious. One thing you have said that is, for example, when women might be able not to say about the division of ethnic division, because women always um, unite because of their gender mm -hmm. throughout the ethnic um, boundaries let alone you know the, the country For throughout the world women are getting together to fight their oppression from yeah. their government so um you know having a division, divided society you are right women might be able to unite them because of their oppression together the women the women they themselves know what yes so that yes so they sympathize right. and then they're the, also good they have wisdom they they have wisdom they're also very good to connect the men you know because i know men want to fight yes they may be bold in the fight against tyranny and so on but women is wisdom women is ability to unite that is very critical that's why otherwise if i'm a politician in ethiopia I would have allowed women organizations if I'm not scared because my, my focus would have been on the men. But this government, I believe that they are scared also with empowered women because they don't want anyone to be Not only this lightened. government, all governments are scared of empowered people, not only women. Yeah. Empowered, empowered women, as you said, women throughout the world stood for peace. Women are the ones who are victims of war so they don't want their children to go to war or they, you know. So they are always talking about peace and uh, peaceful coexistence. And so because of that, of course, that empowers people. And that might be a reason for um, the government to uh, bar some of the, uh, you know, some of the issues, yeah. some of the uh, advocacy situations. So we talked about why women are not leading, partly because women themselves they are not seeking leadership positions because of some uh, unproductive belief systems within them. They may think that they're not qualified or they may think that uh, uh, they won't be respected or they think that they may not be heard and so on and so forth. But what are some of the things that men could do to help women 
come out and take leadership positions because when they do that, it's beneficiary not only to the women, it's also beneficiary to the men, to their children, and to the future and to the country because we are losing the potential, the ability of the majority of our population. So what men should do to men support? Also sorry, men also should be conscious of what you said now. Women are half of the population. They are their mothers, sisters, aunts, grandmothers, and they should be conscious of that they should be treated equal. Okay. Men should be conscious of that. And there are many men who fought for women uh, equality in Ethiopia and in, in many countries. So they should be able to be conscious of that, of women are as much, can do as much as you would do, or what would you do, for example? You know, you came here and you didn't see uh, many women, and you were surprised. So, but a month, uh, I mean, a year later, when you came back, you have a couple of women here. And so the fact that you, d you noticed that there are no women, it's not because you needed diversity, but you could, you, I, I'm the sure you have said that. Their contribution is, and, is uh, very important. Yeah, yeah. So men have to, and another thing is, for example, when we have women's organizations, men say, why women's organization? I mean, is, is it necessary to have a separate organization for women? Do we have to have a separate organization for men? No, women are doubly oppressed. And because of that situation, they have to have a space for themselves to be uh, conscious, okay? Uh, I can give you an example. Uh, I remember when we had our first conference of the, uh, to, be, to start crew here about four years ago. It was a three um, day conference. And um, around 100 women came from different states in the Canada. Through the huge. Yes, through the three days, yeah. you know, not all the time at one yeah. time, but through the three days. And at the end of the conference, this woman got up and she said she has been here for many, many years, and well-educated woman, and she said, this is the first time i holding a microphone. Wow. I have never spoke in a public gathering. This is the first time. And at that time, she was empowered yes. because we were there women only, we were discussing our issues, the social, political, and economic issues in the country and the diaspora. And she was so much uh, related to those issues and she spoke in public and she said, this is the first time I, I'm holding her. And it's such an emotional time and, and other women came and she said you know, she, that she was abused by her uh, husband. Uh, she brought a two-year-old baby with her. and. Immediately, the women around there try to support her to, by finding a social worker. And so people were open in that kind of situation because there was a space for us to talk about our issues. That doesn't mean we are against men. men yes. N not, not at all. These men are also, just like we said, they are our brothers, husbands, children, sons, uncles. These are our, our own people. Exactly. But what we are asking for is, Okay, if you want to work with us, we let us also um, be conscious of the issues so that we could be equal instead of just being invited to come and talk what you asked me to talk. But let me be part of it. Let me be aware of the situation. So that is, men, I misunderstand that. So you are, you are organizing women only. You know, I get this all the time, many, many years. You know, why are you always concerned about women? No, I'm not only concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the family. When you are concerned about women's issue, you are concerned about well, the families. Uh, so do you invite men to your conferences? Do you involve men into your activities? Yes. Uh, the first conference I was telling you was only for women, for three days. And as, as a result of that conference, we created a crew. But after that, we have had s several conferences. And men are speakers, men are involved, men support us. And men fund us, you know, because they know what they, we are doing now. They are very comfortable of what we are doing. It's not an association that's gathered to, you know, Oppose bash. Men and men, just no, yeah. no. This Create is tension between men and women. I think that's smart because in the past, 
many of uh, you know women rights organizations they always invited women they uh, you know, marginalize or uh, you know avoid men and the struggle is all about women liberating themselves from men i think that's not a very smart way of approaching the issue because there are many men that uh, support that uh, women should be in leadership, so they should be involved. And also any struggle, you know, uh, women may be minorities in government, minorities in organizations. If they bring, you know, men, they become now majorities. So they should not fight this fight alone. Yes, it's, uh, this issue is um, raised many, many times throughout the women's liberation movement in the early years. Um, in America and throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, women, initially they thought that to liberate ourselves, we have to be independent of men. Yeah, yeah. yeah independent of men. But um, through the years, things have changed, you know. Um, there is this, uh, this is the stage of consciousness. Um, I don't know if I, I, t I taught so many years philosophy of adult education. And one of the philosophers which I, I admire very much and learn is called uh, Paulo Freire. He's, I don't know if you have heard of him. He's a Brazilian adult educator. He died in 1997. He laid out uh, stages of consciousness, you know, how to raise your consciousness. And um, I'm not going to take the time, but I just want to show you how. Yes, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, it uh, may help uh, us how women, for example, can let go of some unproductive limiting beliefs and raise their consciousness because if they don't raise their consciousness, it's unlikely that they know their rights, they don't know their potential, and also they don't know how to take their consciousness to the next level, take their involvement in our community to the next level. So it's good. So yeah. uh, tell us a little bit more, um, more on that. Yeah, more on that is like the stages of consciousness is the first stage, not only in, in women, in any society, the first stage is that people do not know they are oppressed. They don't. Um, they will say, oh, this is, you know, God gave me this, and, uh, you know, this is my lot, you know, this, I'm supposed to be like this. This is my destiny. This is my destiny, you know. And then through the process of uh, consciousization, um, then what Paulo Freire did was that he trained some people, and he sent them to this neighborhood in, in Brazil where um, he would take one word, which is very, very st word, important word in that community, either farmers, women, and that word would be generative word, like empowerment. And through that empowerment, they talk about empowerment. What is empowerment? You know, what, all this. And then they learn the alphabets. So he was teaching literacy in, 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 this, in the same time. He said the first one is not knowing that you are oppressed. The second level is when you start knowing that you are oppressed through those generative words. Then you ask questions. Why am I in this kind of situation? Who is do, in doing what to me? It's not God. You know, there must be some, some reason. You're so you get angry. Man, yeah. Yes, so the first one is to be angry. To be angry. So like in the women's movement in this country, they took their brass out and they, they threw it away in the 70s because they are angry. You know, this is the one, this that doesn't define me. And then the next stage, when you are more aware of the situation, is angry is not the solution. Productive and it's not sustainable. So, so what can I do? Who is the oppressor? You know. Then they started knowing that we can get organized. We can ask about our rights. So they started asking about their rights, and the solution. The so solution. the question is, what kind of things are you doing to raise the consciousness of women? Okay, so that's what I'm telling you. This is a process which, you know, a very well educated person. Um, race. So in the, for women in the community where they are, in the grassroots, they can start uh, saying, okay, why is uh, food expensive? I mean, why, how come I don't have enough food for me, but the other person is not being jealous, but reality, what's, the, what's, the, what's wrong with it? So they get together and they started, you know, first of all, identifying what is the issue. The second t role after that would be, OK, where do we go to seek help? Shall we go to the government and ask this? The third is, why should I ask and beg? I need, this is my right. I need to demand. I'm a human being. I, ca I, have, I can't live you know, like this. So they would, they would start organizing and start demanding their rights. 
In order to do that, they have to start from the grassroots level for women to be organized. At the school level, those, those who are at least in the high school or, or, or even after that, then they start sitting and discussing their issues. And then recognizing what is so important that they have to do to improve their lives. Okay, so they could, they could organize. But these are the kind of steps that we have to take. In this society, where we are now, it's the same thing in the United States. They have to get together and find out, you know, this, the United States is the best place where you can get organized because this is a society organization. You cannot build a democracy without a civil society. The civil society is the strongest arm of uh, uh, democracy. So it's, uh, America is known for that. It has thousands, millions of civil society organizations. So if something happens in their community, the first thing they do is get organized. If someone is killed in their community, they get organized and, and ask questions about it. And then through that process, they can ask, demand their rights. Uh, you know, why this is happening, this, there should be change. So this is the kind of steps that women should do also. Uh, let's uh, find some solutions, suggest some recommendations. How do you think community organizations, schools, and other, uh, including the government, could uh, do something to empower women? Okay, um, the government has a lot to offer. Um, as I said earlier, the, the, the constitution is a very good constitution in, in written. Uh, it allows women to get organized, allows women to, to do a number of things. In fact, it has some, uh, you know, leverage for uh, going, you know, joining the parliament. 30% of parliament is allocated for women. You know, all these are in written very good. Schools also can do something. The curriculum should be including, uh, you know, gender sensitive curric curriculum. Uh, there are, you know, things started, something like that. Um, the community should be supportive of women's organizations. They are part of the community, so they should be supportive. How, how can they support? Or how they support? They do support them by donating money to the organizations or allowing them to use their facilities for, for women, um, you know, and not for women not to say, okay, they are organized to do something. But believe them, they are organizing to improve their lives and the community's lives. Um, okay, after we say that the government, not only in written, but also creating the enabling environment to be able to implement those laws. Okay, so right now, the Ethiopian government has good laws written, but b they cannot be implemented because of the conditions right now. So these conditions have to be changed. The CSO law has to be repealed, in my opinion. The freedom of speech and freedom of association have to be approved, I mean, uh, uh, implemented, um, all those laws. So the government has a big role to play. Um, the committee, as I said, have to support them, and also not to be suspicious of women being organized. They are organizing for their family, for their community, and for their country. So these are the kind of things, you know, women and I mean, the community and the government should do. What kind of support, for example, women should give to some other activities? You know, there are out there people fighting injustice, uh, fighting for democracy, freedom, the rule of law, and so on. What should be the role of women and how can they boost this struggle against tyranny? Women are part of the community. Okay. They are organizing not only for self-help, but also for their empowerment, for their liberty. And so women should be uh, supported um, you know, through these organizations. But the, through these organizations, social, social change is not only asking you know, out, out in demonstration, but social change starts being conscious. What do I need you know, for my community? What do I need for my uh, country? What, what do I need for, for being a citizen? What's my right? And what's my responsibility? Once they know that their the rights and responsibilities, they could be able to, they fight, could be able for to fight for it. It's not just for the sake of fighting, but they 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 to face these results. realities day to day. They are saying these realities, and have to fight for their liberation from being oppression. So it comes so natural uh, when people are so conscious. It comes so natural 
to, 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 to demand those things. So what crew is doing right now to empower women? What kind of projects do you have in the near future? Okay, crew, as I said earlier, um, was created as a result of the first international conference of Ethiopian women in the diaspora. And um, we had that conference, as I told you, had a number of people, about 100 people through the three days. And we discussed different issues, economic, social, political issues of Ethiopian women at home and in the diaspora. And at the end of the conference, um, we decided to create an organization which is uh, which to promote the rights of Ethiopian women worldwide. And um, that was in, it was created in 2012. Um, several, week, several months later, there was an organization before that. It's called Ethiopian Women for Peace and Development, which stayed for 21 years. And that women, that organization merged with us to become a very strong uh, and yeah, women organization. Really cool. One, one, we, we became one. And since then, um, our goals are three, and, uh, you know, objectives are three. Number one, education. Just like we said, we, we wanted to educate people in general, not only women, about the situation of Ethiopian women at home and abroad. Um, through conferences, through workshops, we have workshops for conflict resolutions, and we had yearly conferences which, in which we raised so many issues about women. The first conference was um, about um, violence against women, and the second conference about the migration of Ethiopian women, and we talked about the different situations of Ethiopian women in the Arab countries. Um, that, that, that time was when the Saudi Arabia deported many Ethiopian migrant workers. And before that, before that even, we had um, several occasions in which we organized workshops to talk about um, the migrant workers' situation. The last one about the CSO, the Charities and Societies Law, which we discussed. These are education part of it. Another part of uh, objective of CRU is to advocacy work. We have advocacy work, and our advocacy work is uh, for women uh, in, in Ethiopia and here, because they, in Ethiopia, some of the organizations cannot function. So we are the one to speak for, some, for the situations in Ethiopia. Do you have any other projects in the near future? Yes, we have the CSO law. We, have, we are going to work on the CSO law right now. Uh, we are going to have um, the advocacy work continue um, about women's rights. These are the projects you are doing all right now, yeah. I think they, they are very important to empower Ethiopian women. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming. And on behalf of Isad and our viewers, I really appreciate you are very busy, but uh, you decided that you're going to be here to talk about why Ethiopian women are not at the front and leading. We had a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much for coming. Here, our viewers, as you can see, we have been discussing about why Ethiopian women are not at the front and leading. We discussed about the why question to provide you background and also the what question to see some of the things that are going on in Ethiopia and in the diaspora concerning women. And also we talked about how, how can we fix this problem and create gender equality in Ethiopia. That's very important. You could be a woman, but you have to play your role and bringing change in Ethiopia. You have to go out, you have to use your talent and uniqueness to support your community and bring change. Without your involvement, the country won't grow. We can enjoy peace, stability, and prosperity. You can be uh, a man watching this, you, but you have to believe that women also could be able to contribute great things for what you're doing, whether it is in the fight against injustice, in the fight against dictatorship or the rule of the lack of rule of law and so on, women's contribution is very important. Support crew, support whatever effort that uh, the women are doing so that together we're going to have a great country. Thank you very much for watching.